Hello, my name is Roisin and welcome to my Southern African reading vlog. As you may know, if you've watched my TBR or my haul, I am reading Southern African fiction this month. Uh, and by Southern African, I don't just mean South Africa, I mean I'm reading books from the south of the African continent. Um, so that is South Africa, Eswatini, Lesotho, uh, let's see if I can do this all off the top of my head, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Namibia, Mozambique, Malawi, um, Angola, um, Madagascar, Comoros, Seychelles, Mauritius. I think that is all of them. I There is a spreadsheet in the description if you would like to check out um, all of the countries will be listed there and also all of the recommendations that I found for books from those countries are also listed there. So if you wanted to do this next month, um, then there are lots of recommendations already set up for you. Or if you're just interested in books from a particular Southern African country, I should have a pretty good list of the ones that have been translated into English and are readily available in the UK at least. So um, I have picked eight books for this challenge, which is the most books that I've picked for a challenge. Um, I'm a little intimidated about it. I'm giving myself full permission to DNF, uh, but we will see how that goes. Fingers crossed, I don't, and fingers crossed, I managed to get through all of them. Okay, <laughs> let's introduce the books. I have talked about these books a few times, so I'll try to be brief. This is the pile of the books that I currently have in physical copy, and the other one I only have on audiobook. So let's talk about those two first. Um, I have The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind by William Kakwamba, and this is a memoir um, about a boy in Malawi in 2002 uh, when there were incredible droughts in Malawi and Malawi was already struggling due to AIDS and famine and this kind of exacerbated that situation um, and he uh, had to drop out of school because his parents could no longer afford the fees um, and he, so he tried to continue his education through the local library and found a book with a wind turbine on the front of it um, and so he decided to try and build a wind turbine to help bring power to this small town in Malawi um, and that is non-fiction as I mentioned it's a memoir. It was also made into a documentary by Netflix but I don't know if it's still on there. I couldn't find it when I looked. I've also got The First Wife, a tale of pol polygamy by Paula Chiziane, which was translated from the P Portuguese by David Brookshaw. And this is my book from Mozambique. Um, and so this is about um, a woman who discovers that her husband has been supporting four other families like he's got four other women that think they're his wife and all these children and so because of the laws of polygamy in Mozambique he has to marry them um and it's kind of about how they get along and it's about like uh gender and colonial influence in Mozambique but I was going to talk about both the ones I didn't have first and then I pick up one I do have Return to the Enchanted Island by Jahari Ravaloson is the other one that I only have the audiobook of and this one is from Madagascar uh, and is translated from the French by Alison M. Charette only the second novel from Madagascar to be published in English, which is really exciting. Um, and it is about a boy called Ayetzi Razak, who is named after um, the first man in creation in Malagasy myth in Madagascar. But he is like apathetic and restless. He ends up going to boarding school in France. Uh, weighed down by his privilege, he struggles to find a foothold. This is a very short book. The audiobook that I have is only four hours long. So um, I am intrigued to see how that fits all of that into four hours. Then I also have Nervous Conditions by Tsitsi Dangaremga. Uh, I tried to read this Vulnerable Body by Tsitsi Nangaremga last year when it was shortlisted for the book prize but didn't manage to get on well with it but I was kind of struggling at that time anyway um, but this is the first book in that novel and this is about Zimbabwe um, and this is about Tambudzai Sigwake who is a um, coming of age 20 years before Zimbabwean independence um, so it's about like her being weighed down by the expectations of her parents and her family um, and her own desire from for independence. I also have House of Stone by Nvuya Rosa Tashuma and this is also about Zimbabwe so I've got two Zimbabwean books um, and this is about a boy who's gone missing and his mother and father want to find him um, but only their uh, only their tenant seems to know anything about it they're like live in tenant but he's almost part of the family but almost isn't quite good enough mad and glorious epic of the death of colonial Rhodesia and the bloody birth of modern Zimbabwe I'm very excited for that kind of historical fiction aspect I don't know much about Rhodesia except that it is a very dark part of the British Empire's imperial past I mean that's saying something considering how dark that past is so 
excited for that one. Then I also have two South African books, both pretty short. Um, so this one is a classic by Alan Patton called Cry the Beloved Country. Father searching for his delinquent son, which takes him into like the underbelly of Johannesburg, pro murder, prostitution, racial hatred, and was first published in 1948 and addresses the problems of race relations in Southern Africa. This one, on the other hand, was voted, the day was called the debut novel of the year by Vogue in 2018 so um much more recent and is about a south african american girl um whose mother has died the blurb is that she's south african and american but doesn't feel like she belongs to either and that her mother is dying so i don't know anything about the plot but i do know that it's written in a really kind of experimental style i think because like it's interspersed like photos and like one sentence pages and stuff so i think there's a lot of um, playfulness with form and things in here so excited for that and then finally my book from Zambia we have The Old Drift by Namwali Serpel which has been praised by everyone pretty much and it is a piece another piece of historical fiction so pleased about that begins in 1904 in a smoky room at the hotel across the river The Old Drift it's like a family saga epic 100 years in the lives of these three families one white one black one brown in zambia um from 1904 and then up until the future so it said it combines like fairy tale romance history and science fiction so i'm expecting a lot of strange like play with genre in this and i am very excited about that i think it's going to be a really good one so there you go. Those are all of the books that I am planning to read. Um, fingers crossed I get to all of them. But like I said, I think in the beginning, I am happy to DNF because there is quite a lot to get through this month. Hello. So I have started The House of Stone by Navuyon Rosa Tshuma. The beginning is kind of setting you up on what the context of the story is. And so, um, like I said, when I told you that what it was about, a boy's gone missing and the, the family's lodger is kind of trying to infiltrate his way into this family. But the book is written from that lodger's perspective. So he's telling us the stories that the father is telling him. And so you've got like double layers of narrative and also this guy being kind of weird and keeping stuff back about his own past, his own history, aside from the fact that the house that the fa that family live in is the house that he used to live in as a child. So he's kind of we know that he's unreliable and we can't necessarily trust what he's saying, what he's leaving out. Set around 2014, um, when the boy has gone missing, um, about the like protests for the independence of Mathwakazi, uh, which is about an independent state for the Ndebele people in Zimbabwe. And then also it flashes back in history to like Zimbabwe fighting for independence um, from the British um, to change from Rhodesia into Zimbabwe like there's mentions of stuff that happened in the 1980s with the genocide in Zimbabwe um during the like civil war that kind of happened after independence um so I'm learning a lot about Zimbabwean history but I really really what I'm really enjoying most about this is the way that it's written I think is really really good it's not super beautiful there's not super like lyrical language but the language sets up character so well like the character of who's telling us and um i think it's done really well it's quite funny there's quite a lot of wit to it but also this real sense of threat and danger um not just because of uh, the like turbulent times of guerrilla warfare in zimbabwe but also because of this guy who's telling you the story and the son that has gone missing and he was the last person to see him but he's not telling the family that happens in the like the prologue i'm not spoiling anything so it's just making me suspicious um and so i yeah i'm really enjoying it really well written really gripping narrative narratively um and a really interesting way to tell a story so so far really enjoying this one so i'm halfway through house of stone now and i i love this book um i haven't finished it yet obviously just said but um so far the first half i love this book it is so well written in a way that makes it it's funny it's accessible it's not like hard to read well the language isn't hard to read there are some subjects in here that are hard to read brutal stuff going on about Zimbabwe's fight for independence and the rise of Robert Mugabe which is really hard to read um but done in such a good way that doesn't feel voyeuristic or anything like that it feels really honest and true the unreliable ability of the narrator the like mysteries that are coming and being unfolded um it's really brilliant like it's thrilling almost captivating one of the best books that i've read so far this year and i haven't finished it yet so obviously could all go downhill but i really don't think 
that Shuma will do that to me. I think I can trust her. I feel like all the characters, there aren't huge numbers of characters, but they all feel so well fleshed out, even though the way that it's written doesn't like get you into, only really lets you see one of them, but you can see his perspective on all of them in such an interesting way because he's telling a story that he's being told. Um, I love books with like layers and storytelling like that. It's just so like emotional and emotive and honest and at the same time clever and um, literary and so you can see the things that she's doing with storytelling and the things that she's doing with language that I just think is so brilliant. Um, if the first half is anything to go by this might be one of my favourite books of the year and so I'm really glad that I picked Southern Africa for my first Reading the Regions channel challenge because of this book. This is a debut that is astonishing. House of Stone is her first novel. She's written short stories, so I feel like I will need to read a short story collection of hers too. Brilliant. Brilliant! And I discovered at the end of this book, the reason it's called House of Stone is because that's what Zimbabwe means. It is really difficult to read. There's a lot of colonial... There's a lot of violence in here um, about the concentration camps and the murder of people, underbelly people um, at the beginning of uh, Zimbabwe's independence. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of hard stuff to read, a lot of like torture and sexual violence and um, brutal brutality, um, but it's cleverly done. We have such a interesting narrator who's so unreliable, he feels really creepy and he does weird shit, um, that kind of mirrors, in a way, the violence of colonial violence and then the violence of the new Zimbabwean government. Um, it follows a lot of history. We've got a lot of like Rhodesia and... Um, Tom something or other who was the Prime Minister and the violence under him. It's so beautifully written, such interesting sentences, so well done. Uh, occasionally strayed a little bit too clearly into telling but I felt like it worked because of the perspective that it's being told from um, and it definitely tries to disorient you and wrong foot you, like you think it's going one way and then things change all of a sudden and I think that the character having it from this perspective of this unreliable kind of sociopathic character um, puts you on edge the whole time you're reading it like from the beginning you know that he's weird and he's trying to infiltrate this family you don't know why what his reasons are or anything about their background but we kind of find out about it and there are no good characters in this <laughs> everyone has done terrible things one of them less so much less so far less so than the others is what they do to survive and then like how violence begets violence and stuff i think this is a really interesting book i've literally just finished it so i feel like i still need to think about it more but brilliantly written really really wonderfully written and this is a debut which is really impressive the way that she like constructs plot as well as the brilliance of her writing and the way that she mirrors her ideas through the use of her characters is really well done there are a couple of things that like could have been tightened up um in terms of the ending ending up being slightly rushed just in relation to one part of it um felt slightly rushed um 100 would recommend that you read this if you want to pick up some southern african fiction um so that's my first southern african fiction of this vlog and it's already been excellent um i've also started to listen to uh return to enchant the enchanted island um but i'm very early on into that so don't want to like i'm like 20 minutes into listening to that audiobook so <laughs> there's not much to say at this point it seems i've read several books from africa and i seem to enjoy most of them and i don't know if there's a joint what kind of part of what I'm reading about here is like a joint literary to see if there's some sort of joint overview some sort of joint literary history that connects these books together in a way that literary world um that reference one another uh, they might interact particularly ones that have been written in English because I feel like there is a there might be a particular like these people might have read Chinua Achebe and that sort of thing um so yeah anyway that's kind of part of the reason that i'm doing this is to see how these things interact with one another and like i mentioned i've already seen parts of um culture that was from west africa um that has similar aspects in malawi which is obviously in southern africa obviously um and that i didn't know i thought that was particularly a west african thing it was just an assumption that i made as an ignorant person um because <sighs> i guess Africa's so huge so I assumed that it hadn't spread anyway so I have started The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind by William Kukwamba um, and this is a memoir about um, a boy who like made a wind turbine in Malawi um, to bring power to his village it's kind of the memoir of his life rather than just this incident so I'm listening to the audiobook it's um 
quite a cool way of telling a memoir because it starts off with him telling like the folk tales of his people in Malawi he's part of the Chewa people um, and so he's telling like the foundation myths of Malawi um, and of like the Chewa people um, and then he's telling his like father's stories the stories that his father told him but they also have a kind of mythical element to it like a magical element which I think is quite interesting and now he's starting to tell the stories of his childhood and again it's imbuing it with that kind of folkloric tale which I think is really cool it's also really interesting to discover how like similar some of the folklore is between other books that I've read from African writers so similar to the Bambara traditions in Segu and similar to the um, Ibo traditions in Rapat Wachinua Achebe there are things that overlap like they're not exactly the same obviously because Malawi is quite a long way from Nigeria like there is some overlapping there particularly in like the style of costume and things like that yeah so far it's just kind of easy listening I can see like it'd be a good book group book so far it's not my favorite currently like whilst that is interesting the actual stories he's telling are fine it's just like nice um I'm sure that there will be going through some hardships at the moment but it feels like yeah I can see why it got made into a film because it feels like a Sunday afternoon film kind of thing I'm halfway through the boy who harnessed the wind and it's gotten to the point of the famine and the cholera epidemic it's hard to um critique someone's memoir someone's personal story in terms of the writing it's very simplistic very plain very straightforward the story itself is harrowing i like the way that he told stories and the light-hearted part felt very well done and like the family and the relationships there were some funny bits with a dog um, which i thought was done well and very clearly written for americans the size of an american hamburger patty and things like that just so it's clearly written like by this malawian man for an american audience um and i feel like in a way it kind of simplifies things like the politics of the country i guess it's not what it's supposed to be doing it's his memoir um and he's not right he doesn't want to write that so that's not what he's writing i would like to hear more about like there are critiques of the government i'm not saying there aren't but like more about the sort of systemic and everything that's going on and like how malawi more about the history and stuff like that but that's not what he's writing he's writing his own personal memoir so it is a history kind of of that period and his family seems to be like not well off not but, but like slightly better off than some of the other families in the area so yeah the parts of the story that are interesting to me are not the parts of the story that this man is trying to tell it feels very kind of individualistic and not really looking at the systems and stuff like that which is fine it's just not my preference so i don't know the boy who harnessed the wind i finished it a couple of days ago overall i think it's a fine book um but it's not like a great book it's very much like a sunday afternoon inspiring film um about a person who goes from like such extreme tragedy and struggles and poverty and makes something of themselves but it's very much an individualistic narrative um i mean it moved me it moved me when he got to the ted conference and all that sort of thing i did feel the inspiration um that the book wants you to feel but I was also thinking things like about how because of the money that he made he could like help his family and help people he knew and I'm like yeah but really shouldn't we be thinking about the systemic reforms needed in order to counteract the years of colonialism and the current corrupt government um to make sure that people don't experience this in the future uh, on a mass level <laughs> which maybe I don't know it's not like his job to do that um but it does kind of take me out of the book also like repeated some just kind of acted as if some misogynistic parts of the culture were just normal and like oh yeah girls they just help out at home or girls don't need an education because their husband can pay for their education like it's fine it's like yeah it felt very much like it was going for the inspiration porn narrative and it didn't quite deal with like some things came up that were like just not dealt with and so it didn't quite work for me um in that respect i felt like there was a lot missing um also once it started to go into like more of the actual mechanics of how he built stuff and like all these different screws and stuff uh, <laughs> i kind of drifted off um because that's just not where my interest lies um so i think i would rather read a non-fiction book about malawi that dealt more with the systemic issues than with how you build a wind turbine out of scrap metal very impressive he was very impressive um that he did that and i don't blame him individually for all of these problems i'm just saying that the book um 
wasn't my prefer my preference in terms of um, a memoir. <laughs> Hello, so I am at work right now. Um, it's my lunch break. I'm not like skiving. Um, I just thought I'd come on to talk to you about my initial thoughts for Return of the Enchanted Island because um, I'm about 20% of the way through now. So far, it's written in like different sections. So there's like the first and the third section are kind of this like folkloric myth history of Malagasy people and Madagascar. And I really like that bit. I like the way it's written. And then the other bit, which is about Ayatsi and his life. Um, and that is feels kind of YA and I don't know if it's just because he's a teenager or the way that it's written very fast paced lots of things happening lots of drama straight away um isn't my favorite because it just feels very like surface um but I'm only 20% of the way through so that may change um as he grows up but yeah so far I'm kind of unsure of it but yeah so far it's fine um but I'm not liking it as much as I'm liking as I liked um House of Stone or um, the Old Drift, which I haven't talked to you about yet because I've only read the first 25 pages of a 600 page book. Um, but I'm just going to spoil a little bit here and so far I like it. Hello, oh, so I am walking home from work in a field. <laughs> um, books. Uh, so I am halfway through Return to the Enchanted Island now and um, I'll try and stop switching hands because I know that's annoying. Um, I'm enjoying it. I'm definitely enjoying the bits that are a retelling of the foundation myth of the Malagasy people more than I'm enjoying the bits that are um, like in the young Ayatsi's life. Um, but now that he's older, I'm enjoying them a little bit more. The writing style's just quite distanced, like it's not my usual style. Hard to tell when that is true when you're reading something that's in translation how much of it is based on the translation um, and also because I only have it in audio copy it's also hard to tell how much of that is the performance rather than the actual words um, like because because I'm not such a huge fan of this performer um, that might be having a negative impact like normally I don't think it really matters because I love audiobooks so much I feel like I can get as much out of them sometimes more in a different way but I feel like with this one I'm really I don't love the performer but I have don't have access to it any other way so um, that is making a difference so I have finished um, Return to the Enchanted Island uh, by Jahari Ravelson and I enjoyed it I think that anybody who likes like modern millennial fiction literary fiction would really get on my worth it it's definitely very much in that navel gazy millennial fiction pose but with the addition of um that kind of mythic stuff that i really enjoy um and the stuff about ayatsi who is named after the, the mythic god but isn't the mythic god i didn't find as interesting um because it was just sort of like quite entitled and quite like posh boy who gets away with stuff which is part of the stuff that it's discussing um but it felt like it did that in a really kind of half-hearted way um and i just didn't get 100 percent on with it like it was very detached and kind of nothingy and i don't mind books where nothing happens but i want more from the writing of the characters i guess i don't really know um what it is about it because i know there are books with plot without plot that i love but i just found that this was so meandering um and i couldn't quite get on with that part of it as much but i really enjoyed the foundation myth part of it so it's kind of um difficult for me to like think of it as a collective because it it is split into two, those two different parts um the writing from the mythical part as well had a lot more lyricism to it um i was a little confused at times but i think that's because foundation myths are always confusing because everyone is always related to everyone else and trying to remember who that how that works is difficult um but yeah, it talked a bit about being an immigrant in Paris, but because of his like rip his wealth and his um, standing in Madagascar, he didn't experience the same things that other non-white immigrants to Paris would have experienced. Like he got away with a lot of stuff purely because of how wealthy he is. Although his family say it's because they are like um, protected by the gods. I'm 20% of the way through um, The Old Drift and I'm really really loving this. Um, I'm loving the writing style, it keeps shifting perspective because we're being told about these three different families. So to begin with it was like the diary of this old colonial man in 1904 in Zambia 
when it was Northern Rhodesia. And then we had, we skipped into Italy um, with the descendants of this man who had been in Rhodesia, different man though, but who knew the first man. And then now we're back, but we're from the perspective of this woman. There are so many magpies. Like, what's going on? I just get them away. Um, with this woman who is blind um, and who marries a man who is Zambian and Zambia's just got his independence. Um, so we're going at quite a clip through the history like we were in 1904 and now we're in 1964 and I'm only about 20% of the way through the book but I like it a lot. I like the change of the style. I like that we're having these chapters in between each change of perspective from the perspective of mosquitoes um, which I think is really interesting I think that it's really beautifully written um, and the way that when it changes character it also changes style which I always love um, it's giving me like Zadie Smith vibes like if you like Zadie Smith I think you would like this book um, so yeah I'm really enjoying it um, <laughs> but there are people around so I'm going to put this away we'll talk again later I'm also now halfway through um, the old drift it's not at all what I was expecting like the beginning was written in this really like colonialist literature way like what you would expect of early 20th century British literature it did such a good job of skewering that so it's gone from 1904 to like 1994 um, about 90 years of history the thing I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble keeping straight to everyone is because it's about these three families so you start off with the first white settlers in um, Zambia and you see their interactions with the um, native people of Zambia and then it goes to the grandmothers a section called the grandmothers which is follows these three women and then it goes to the mothers three other women um, but they are interconnected and different people from different parts of the story come into other parts of the story and so um, you have to kind of keep on the head of who everyone is because there'll be different names and I'm like wait wait was this person did this person play a part in an earlier part or am I forgetting I really like this writing style um, I think it has a lot of wit and humor it's really funny I really wasn't expecting it to be so funny because um, I've just read House of Stone first and that was so dark and this is so much levity to it compared to that and it does deal with some harder themes as well but everything's dealt with in such a like light funny humorous way it kind of reminds me of Zadie Smith kind of her writing where it deals with serious topics but there's so much like lightness and humor and wit and it's kind of Austonian in its social satire um, I think it's doing such a great job of that of like satirizing the colonial narrative um, but also the culture of Zambia um, the bit about a Zambian like freedom fighter guy who kind of goes a bit mad and um, starts up this um, space force but they don't have any signs and he's just rolling people down hills in barrels and stuff and it was really really funny and it's kind of skewering that um, idea of the charismatic uh, revolutionary leader I think it did it in such a good way and the way it's talking about gender and everything it's definitely very focused on women in this time there are male characters who are central as well but it's very female focused and I always enjoy that in a book so yeah I think this one this one has more broad appeal I would say that compared to the other two fiction books I've read I would say this one is probably the one that would have the most broad appeal but it is still really smart and very witty um, and very well done and and also it's got such brilliant language the way that it's written is so brilliant and bold so I'm really enjoying that as well hello so I have finished the old drift I don't know how I feel about it like straight off finishing it I loved like four fifths of this book and I also really enjoyed the ending but there was a bit just I'm not sure around which point but at some point it diverges from actual history and turns into an alternate history I'm not sure if the whole thing is an alternate history if the dam mentioned at the start is not built at all it's definitely towards the end like for example the guy who is president of Zambia at the end stopped being president in 1994 but in this one has become a one-party state um, I don't think that's really gonna change I don't think that's really a spoiler that will ruin the book in any way for you but so there are things like that and then there's also so started off being historical fiction and moving through this history and then it moves into a much more science fiction space but it's more on the speculative end of science fiction like we don't go into space there are no aliens it's not that kind of science fiction um but it, it's more on the speculative end and very like technological focused and i'm not a huge science fiction reader um but i can get on board with some speculative stuff particularly when the speculative stuff started being introduced into this it was done in a very naturalized way and also a lot of it was through conversations like the way people were talking about the world talking about politics i love that when characters 
have like what feels like real discussion exposition for what the world is like but through characters perspectives think of like Bernardina Veristo, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, uh, Zadie Smith that kind of vibe um, definitely got that towards the end in fact I would say that this book feels so Zadie Smith to me so white teeth to me specifically like following three families through the generations that are interconnected of different racial backgrounds um, so there's characters in here who are white Zambian, characters in here who are coloured Zambian, which we would say mixed race, but in Southern Africa, coloured is the like correct term. People in here who are black Zambian and um, people in here who are of Indian descent in Zambia as well. So there's like a whole range of that. It talks about colonialism in the same way that White Teeth talked about colonialism um, and also has that science fiction gene editing aspect of it, which was also in White Teeth and this kind of culminating at the end in a big like we start off as disparate people from different backgrounds and slowly get together and gather until we get to that piv pivotal event. Um, so yeah, if you liked if you liked White Teeth, I think you would like this. And I did like White Teeth. However, I think that the very end of this started to get a little bit too plotty for me, <laughs> which I know a lot of people like, but it was so different from the rest of the book that was very insular and slow moving and like very much character focused, very much about character development. And then, as I said, about all those discussions, the people, the way people were talking to each other, like Bernadine Everisto like in the fact that you could see like from everyone's perspective, you could see why they had those views. You could see their, their flaws whilst they were also presenting themselves in a certain way. I thought that was really good, really well done into each other, into different characters perspectives. But yeah, there was was just a section where it got a little bit too plotty but then at the end it kind of brought it back again and um I really enjoyed that there are also sections throughout here that are told from a specific perspective there are little vignettes told from that perspective repeatedly throughout um that are like prose poems and I I flicked back and forth between reading this and listening to the audiobook and when I listened to the audiobook I could really hear the prose poem aspect of it that like internal rhyme and stuff I thought was done really well incredibly beautiful writing but this is definitely a really really good book and like I said if you like any of those authors I've mentioned particularly Zadie Smith but Bernadine Everisto or Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie I think you would like Namali Sapel as well um her writing really fits in that kind of vibe. I really, really, really liked it, um, but there was just a slight bit that could have been a bit different for me. Um, I felt it didn't quite pull itself off the right way, but that was such a tiny part of it. Um, I loved it for so much of it. Uh, and top of that, I've started Cry the Beloved Country by Alan Patton. I'm about 20% of the way through that book. I started it at my lunchtime yesterday. It feels like it's going to be a very quick read. Um, I'm really enjoying the way that it's written so far. Um, I think that the style is really beautiful. We've got quite into the plot quite quickly, but I'm kind of enjoying, it's about this guy whose son has gone missing in Johannesburg and he's not from Johannesburg, so he goes and visits and he's kind of overwhelmed by the big city, but he's meeting different people in Johannesburg and you get kind of, even though I'm only 20% of the way into it, we're getting quite a good overview of that time period from him meeting so many different people. We're kind of getting exposed to lots of different um, people and lots of different ideas like the different backgrounds and the set setting it up quite well and um, there's still a lot to go through as I mentioned I'm only 20% um, of the way in so um, I'm not really fully into the plot yet I'm sure there's a lot more that could happen um, but so far I am enjoying it and I like his turn of phrase. I am halfway through Cry the Beloved Country and um, about a third of the way through What We Lose and normally I've been trying to talk about these books all separately so there's like a clear section where I talk about all of them and because I am reading both South African books next to each other and because they talk about similar things from a very different perspective it feels necessary to talk about the two together. I'm feeling confused about this. I feel like this is a classic from the 1940s and I like the way that it's setting everything out. It's very clearly written for outsiders which is something that I've been thinking about in regards to these books written for outsiders versus written for insiders this has like a glossary in the back which always lets you know it's written for outsiders but alan Patton was writing from outside of south africa when he wrote this book at the start of apartheid so i feel like he was writing it for outsiders to gain an understanding of what was going on in south africa this book also has as its main character a priest and a lot of biblical references a lot of the characters are named after biblical characters a lot of the writing feels like there is a biblical influence to it in the way that it's written um and he saw this and he was not afraid sort of thing i am someone who was raised without religion um and although both my parents were raised catholic i don't have a strong understanding or knowledge base when it comes to the bible because it's not something 
something that I learned about in school rather than something that I have personal experience of. There is more that I could get from this. It's not distracting me though. I think this is very beautifully written, although in a way similar to a lot of mid-century classics, it does have a couple of uses of slurs in it. Um, the K word is used in this book and I don't mean the K word about Jewish people, I mean the South African K word that's the equivalent of the N word. And there's also, there was also a section where um, they went to a place where these priests were preaching for blind people and a lot of the language felt ableist. However, it felt like it would have been progressive in 1948, the way that he was talking about disability, and it comes across as ableist now. Obviously, that's a complex idea because we can't excuse the past for being what it was, but we also have to understand the context in which it was writing. And if he was coming from a progressive place at the time, did that make a difference? Um, anyway, what we lose, I've read about a third of, as I said, um, and it very much feels like a memoir, even though it is fiction, but it, it is auto fiction, but it's said loosely based, but it feels very much like someone is telling me their life story, which might be the intention. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the writing style. It's very, very plain. There's no beauty in it. And I thought it was going to be much more experimental than it is, but it feels more disjointed than experimental. I like experimental things and I was looking forward to something that was doing something with the form, but the writing itself being so like plain and nothingy has made the form just feel accidental, not intentional. But the reason that I felt like I needed to talk about the two together is because of the themes they explore. So this book is from 1948 and this book is from 2018, but they are still talking about the same divisions. Um, it's interesting comparing it to the old drift about Zambia or the, um, the Boy Who Harnessed the Wind about Malawi or uh, House of Stone about Zambia. No, the old drift about Zambia and the House of Stone about Zimbabwe. Um, the, the, all those books contained violence and acts of violence and terrible things that happened to people but they were violence of colonialism violence of dictators um famine which is man-made that sort of thing where it's kind of cut and dry kind of clear where the problem lies and you can see how the people who are causing the problem could see themselves not as the villains but you can see like it's clear who is the victim and who is and whilst obviously colonialism happened in South Africa as well, the way that it's all just feels a bit more muddled, the way that both of these are writing about it, and I don't know enough about South Africa and I feel very ignorant talking about it, uh, it's not straightforward in both of these and I think that that's the thing that I'm coming to realise about South Africa because there are multiple levels, like it's not just colonizers and indigenous people it is different indigenous nations zulus and swazis and lots of different indigenous nations and also english-speaking foreigners and afrikaners who do not like each other <laughs> and then there are colored people or mixed race people and then there are also people of indian descent um and so there's a whole lot of different stratifications that from an outside position very difficult to understand the caste system i suppose is the clearest way to understand it the caste system of south africa is very complex and the violence is very <sighs> interpersonal like it feels like small violence in a way when compared to genocides and war crimes etc that i've been reading about in the other books it feels like small violence of robberies and shootings but obviously it's systemic and it is obviously stems from the whole complex background and i feel like i need to read like a whole history of south africa because i don't really know anything about the colonization of south africa i feel like we don't learn about colonization a lot in the uk despite being the country that colonized than most other countries this is a whole ramble about my ignorance basically essentially but also about the violence in both of these books because in both in cry the beloved country there is a murder that is at the center of the book and the first book the first section isn't from one perspective the second section which i've just begun is from a different perspective they're all kind of related through this death and in what we lose it is also about a death although a death through illness not through violence but um Zinzi Clemens is talking about the violence in South Africa and also the anti-black violence in America being like South African 
um, American. She's talking about the comparisons and the differences, and she's talking about the differences of racism in America and racism in South Africa, um, which are interesting topics. I just wish the writing was better and more interesting. Anyway, I feel like this was kind of a ramble um, because I'm like right in the midst of everything right now. My thoughts aren't very clear or structured in any way um, that I literally have just got to halfway through this book and turned my camera on. So these are very unpolished thoughts and perhaps um, if I have said something horrendously ignorant that offended or was horribly incorrect please let me know in the comments down below um of course this is not the end of the vlog so i will keep reading and i will do some reading around it as well um but yeah i just felt like i've been having a lot of thoughts and i wanted to bring them to you even whilst they were half formed um hopefully they'll be more fully formed before the end of the vlog does this not just feel a bit rupee cower to anyone else Okay, so I've got to halfway of What We Lose and I've decided to DLF it. I don't like the writing style. I find it kind of boringly pretentious. Like, it feels very stiff and it's trying to do something profound and failing. Um, and so that's the main reason that I'm not really getting on with the writing style. Overwritten? and underwritten at the same time like it's very plain and stark which is not my preference anyway but also like it doesn't trust me as a reader and has to hit every button on the nose so I can understand what's going on even though I don't need that. It's not set in South Africa <laughs> and I'm reading Southern African fiction and Zinzi Clemens is a South African American writer. It's not that none of these books could be written about something other than the history or the culture of their countries of course you can be a south african writer and write about losing your mother that's not something that's a problem if this book had been about losing your mother in south africa by a south african woman and she was writing about losing her mother and her experiences weren't being in college or whatever weren't just american experiences then that would be different this feels so much more american than it feels related to south africa like there has been some mentions in the first third like I talked about before about South Africa but literally nothing has been about South Africa since then and so I feel like it kind of doesn't quite fit and I mistook that when I was reading it when I was reading the blurb or reading about it I thought it would be more South African and it was like written as being by a South African author but it feels much more like it's by an American author um, and about America. I have finished Cry the Beloved Country by Alan Patton. It's one of those books that I feel a bit conflicted about and feel like I need to sit and think about for a bit longer before I actually come to any conclusions about my feelings. At the moment what I'm thinking is that I think the writing is really lovely. I think a lot of the writing was really beautiful and powerful. Um, I like the way that it used characters to introduce different arguments that were being had at the time. Talked about the complexities of the situation in South Africa um, in the 1940s but without like it wasn't like everyone's got a position opinion and everyone's opinion should be respected it wasn't like that but it was explaining it was giving a lot of the different points of view whilst also characters who were the most moral and the most like upright um were the like black people <laughs> um although it did talk about like native crime as they call it in the book but um yeah i'm talking about where that came from there was a lot of different um aspects put in here there was a lot of like biblical references and a lot of writing that was similar to biblical way of writing or the writing in the King James Bible at least um, and I thought that if I had been religious or had known the Bible better then I might have grasped that better. Um, I enjoyed it but at times it felt a little too much like we must forgive everyone if that makes sense and also yes the ending felt kind of very easy and very trite um, and very much like we can all get on just believe in your brothers kind of thing um, and I felt like this was written in a way that would have been progressive for the 1940s but feels very regressive or feels somewhat regressive to me now um, which is not necessarily a bad critique it's just how I feel towards the book um, and I, yeah I did feel a bit like it was very much like see everyone can be good and it felt like it simplified some of the complexity like it felt like it was presenting a lot of the different arguments but it simplified some of the background I don't know I'm not a huge I don't know how to explain what I mean but I'm not a huge expert obviously in South Africa or what South Africa was like in the 1940s um I'm quite ignorant of that sort of thing so um it felt like it was very much written for an outsider like me um and also but also it was kind of written for a white European audience 
in order to help them to express sympathy towards black people without like really challenging themselves too much I think is kind of my major takeaway in terms of the morality of the book um the plot as well it's a very very simple plot very predictable very easy um so I don't know I feel like that the, maybe I'm missing something as someone who does not know enough about South Africa um maybe there is more to it that I am not understanding the nuances of um of the perspectives <laughs> I would consider it to be still a little colonialist in the way that it talks about South Africa um because even like the hero kind of there's kind of this character who's kind of like a martyry hero thing the way that he talks about it was permissible for us to do this but it's no longer permissible it's like why was it permissible in the first place um and so i feel like quite light on critique but maybe in the 1940s it would have felt like a massive critique so like i've said i feel like possibly i was missing the context to get all of this but um in some regards i did like it it is really beautiful it is really beautifully written really beautifully written then we i've started the square book um i can't remember who it was sorry but i know one of you was traumatized by how square this book was um i am yeah so i'm about 100 pages in which is about like 20 percent of the way through this book so far i'm again really conflicted about this book i am really intrigued by the cultural stuff that it's talking about and i also think that the characters are pretty well set up already um i am liking the way that it is like critiquing the structures of the society that it's talking about but in a way that is accessible for me as an outsider which is not necessarily what it was written to do but I am finding it accessible to understand things the way that it's explaining stuff but I feel like it would work on a deeper level for someone who already knows a lot about Mozambique this is set in Mozambique about a woman who finds out her husband has been cheating on her with numerous people um and so it's about polygamy it says on the front a tale of polygamy so um although it seems like in Mozambique if you have sex with a woman she's a wife like um cheating on a woman is engaging in polygamy in a way um so yeah i'm intrigued by that but but the writing is not good <laughs> like the writing feels almost childlike i also feel like we're rushing through getting introduced to all of these other women um it doesn't feel very like organic um and obviously it's really hard to critique writing when you're talking about a translated work because when i'm saying the writing feels childlike the writing in english feels childlike there are metaphors but they're like constructed in the most simplistic english possible um which you know it's not my preference for a reading style but how much of that is the translator like how much of that is down to david brookshaw and how much of it down to paula kitsiane so i feel like the fact that i don't speak portuguese i can't judge the writing can't judge Chitiane's writing anyway because I don't know what she wrote I just know what David Brooks uh Brookshaw translated it as so it's very quick read so far very compelling read but yeah I'm just a bit like I don't know I'm, I'm not loving the writing the writing is not drawing me in but I'm intrigued by the plot and I feel like because like I said because it's um translated I can't like judge the writing so harshly so I'm gonna keep going with this one I'm not doing anything this one yet hello yes I am hungover we are rolling with it um and I am too close to the camera but I can't be asked to move it regardless um I am now halfway through The First Wife by Paula G Paulina Giziane and I'm still feeling really weirdly conflicted about this book I find the plot quite compelling the dialogue sucks um and is very explanatory everything's very like on the surface and explanatory so i'm really intrigued by the culture i'm enjoying the plot like i'm halfway through and it's kind of got to the point where i thought it was going to get to and i'm intrigued to see how it keeps going and goes forward um but yeah i'm not really i'm not really super loving the writing so this is a really weird book for me it's a very quick and easy read but i just feel a bit like I don't know how to feel about this book really um i'm gonna try and finish it today but i feel like i'm not giving you a very good um overview because i feel so confused by it yeah so i would say that south africa zambia and zimbabwe whilst they haven't all been the same obviously there's been a fair amount of overlap not necessarily the same amount of cultural overlap as i felt there was between the zambia zimbabwe south africa um so it is cool to read a different perspective like madagascar was a different perspective I'm pleased I picked it up anyway because it is different from all the others. Um, the First Wife, The First Wife by Paula Giziane, I have now finished. And this is the first book ever to be published by a woman from Mozambique, or at least that's what it says in the back, which is really cool. Um, however, I didn't love it. Um, it was really interesting hearing about all of the um, like cultural things, um, but the characters were not characters. <laughs> they didn't have any development and the writing itself was pretty clunky. Um, 
the metaphors like piled up on each other and they weren't particularly beautiful now of course it's originally in portuguese so as i've said before i don't know how much of that is due to the translation rather than due to the writer herself um it's hard to know when you don't read portuguese um how much has been lost in translation interesting really intriguing like i kept being pulled on to what was going on with the plot in the first half and then in the second half i felt like it just carried on just a little too long um i definitely think it was worth reading for me like i wouldn't necessarily think this was worth reading if you just wanted a really good novel because i don't think it's a really good novel like it's fine if you are really interested in the culture of mozambique or you want to learn more about mozambique i think this is an interesting place to start um and i think that it reminded me kind of of like greek plays in a way i don't know if that makes any sense but the way that the characters are all like they just say things that don't seem to make sense for their character or they're just stereotypes like it reminded me of lysistrata in a way which maybe was intentional i don't know but in lysistrata the greek women from all over greece give up sex in order to end the peloponnesian war and in this novel it's not quite as grandiose as that but there are women from all over mozambique and they talk about cultural practices in different parts of mozambique like in uh, Lysistrata they talk about cultural practices from all over Greece um, and it's also a lot related to sex and it's very much men do this women do this men do this women do this and part of that is about the power dynamic in Mozambique which was more interesting but part of it's just like women are feeling and men are greedy and I'm like oh it's not it's not that nuanced there's not a lot of nuance in this book so an interesting experience for me but not I think a novel that will stick with me in terms of as a book. I read about 20% of Nervous Conditions by Tsitsi Dangaremga and I'm pleasantly surprised by this and I say pleasantly surprised because I think I mentioned at the beginning of this video that I uh, re started to read This Mournable Body by Tsitsi Dangaremga in November December last year and I couldn't quite get on with it and I was in a stage of like burnout at that point so that might have had something to do with it. This one finding much more accessible so maybe it's good that I have started with the first in the trilogy maybe that's part of what was the problem although I think feel like they're like standalone books that interconnect more than they are like a trilogy where you need to know what's happened before it has a lot more humor than I was expecting the first line is I was not sorry when my brother died really cold and disconnected but actually I fi I'm finding a lot of the descriptions of everything has so much humor and I think that um Dangaremga is doing a really good job of using a child protagonist to tell the story um and but well i guess it's not quite a child protagonist because the voice keeps talking about in the past and when i was um that it's so it's told in the first person from someone recalling their childhood but she kind of mentions um kind of talks about the construction of the narrative in a way so she says things like oh um I was five so I couldn't know at the time what was happening but I have since asked people and this is what they said and these are things that I have found out. I can see why it's so highly praised um, so far because there's a lot of competence in the writing especially compared to the, the first wife. Um, so yeah I'm enjoying that I'm going to keep reading these hopefully I'll finish them both today but who knows. Uh, so I am also now halfway through Nervous Conditions by Tsitsi Dangaremga and I'm really enjoying this. Um, I think this book has made me realise that I love a coming of age story. It's not something I'd ever really considered before as something that I particularly enjoy. I think because I don't particularly read a lot of YA and YA doesn't usually speak to me that much um, and I'd kind of pushed coming of age into YA but this is a coming of age literary fiction novel and um I'm really enjoying that aspect of it it's interesting because I tried to read this mournable body and couldn't get through it I was kind of intimidated by this book but I'm halfway through and this book is really really readable it feels like auto fiction I don't know if it's at all related to Tsitsi Dengarebka's life I'd have to look that up but it feels like there's a lot of references to I'm her writing and the person writing this story which I think really works because it makes you question the perspectives like what could she know what is she telling us what is she not telling us what's she hiding from us writing itself is not lyrical i wouldn't say but it is very very competent very well done very readable um and i was worried that this wasn't going to be readable i thought it was going to be very cold and clinical because that's how i felt about this mournable body um but i don't feel that about this i don't know if it's because it's like teenagers more accessible 
the characters are less jaded than they were in this vulnerable body or maybe it's just my personal headspace but so far i'm really really loving this one it's a very slow very like small story like compared to like house of stone or the old drift that really were big epics this is much much more a small close focus on one character and their journey story but i love that as well like i like both having a mixture of the two is good so um yeah i'm excited to continue this is not really talking about zimbabwean history at all like it's still rhodesia in this book um and it's not really talking about that at all although it does comment on like race relations in Zimbabwe a little bit but not a huge amount and I don't know if that's because the other book House of Stone that I read about Zimbabwe was set during the Zimbabwean fight for independence and afterwards like action related to the history in it than this does um this is just very much so much a smaller story but that doesn't make it a lesser book hello so I have finished Nervous Conditions by Tsitsi Dangaranga which means that I have finished all of the books that I intended to read for uh, reading books from Southern Africa. So first I'm going to wrap this one up and then we'll wrap up everything together. I really really enjoyed this book. I think it is one of, it's a really really strong book. Um, I definitely think it's a book where if you don't like things, books where nothing happens you won't enjoy this book because there's really not a driving plot or any sort of conclusion at the end. It is the first in a trilogy though so that might have something to do with it um, and I do feel like I want to read the rest of this trilogy which I'm really pleased about because as I've mentioned before I read started to read the third one in this trilogy and couldn't get a handle on it so I'm pleased that I liked this one and it didn't feel at all distanced which was the problem that I had with this mournable body. This one felt much more um, close. It didn't feel clinical at all, it felt very very tangible. So I read this whole book and then I read the introduction afterwards which um, is something that I tend to prefer to do because introductions often have spoilers. In fact this introduction did have spoilers and whilst I'm not necessarily against spoilers I would rather read the book as the author intended rather than read the introduction first and get spoiled you know. So um, I yeah I'm glad I read the whole thing first but when I read the introduction it introduced me to the concept of a safari novel which is a concept when people are talking about African writing of African writing that African novels that are written for an outsider where things are explained or glossed for someone who won't understand because they don't come from that culture um, and I thought that that was really interesting a really interesting perspective to look at all these other books at are they for the outsider which is something that I was considering whilst reading the books but I'd never heard it had a term um, so the safari novel I think this book is playing with the idea of safari novels and of who the reader will be in fact at the very beginning it says um I am sorry I was not sorry when my brother died nor am I apologizing for my callousness as you may define it my lack of feeling so from the very outset this book is being written to you um to a reader um Tsitsi Dengarambaga has no idea who I am so obviously it's not being written for me it's making you be aware of what the framing device is like what the framing is who is it being directed at and um I don't think it's written as a safari novel there's no glossary as there was in um cry the beloved country which i think is probably a really good example of a safari novel none nothing was explained in terms of cultural things nothing was like we did this because of this and um the names that different people have so different people have multiple different names and from what i gather it is because of um like what your status in relation to them and who you can call someone uh call someone what you can call someone whether and whether they're like your uncle or um like whether the oldest brother or the youngest brother like the difference in status indicates what they are called so different people call people different things which wasn't explained directly to me but also wasn't impossible for me to understand like it didn't feel alienating either um which i think is more to say something about the reader than about a book that if you feel alienated but yeah this book deals with a lot of it's about gender and also about colonialism and race um which wants to get an education um and it's about like how she can't because she's a woman and it's a lot about the women in her family and it's about gender placement but it's also about how seeing your culture from outside of your culture or from being um confronted with another culture like englishness and how that relates to how you understand your own culture while this book feels really simple um the writing is very very skilled very well done but it's not beautifully lyrical and there's not a lot of complicated things going on like it's literally about a girl and what happens to her during her childhood and how she gets an education and the relations in with her family and stuff like that that's literally all that happens in this book but it's doing a lot there's a lot to think about a lot of themes and ideas and like perspectives to grasp um, and i think it's done in such a subtle way um i think that 
it gives you a lot to think about and it's definitely one that I would like to read again. So I read um, seven books for this and DNF one. So the one I DNF we know is What We Lose by Zinzi Clemens, which I DNF because of a mixture of writing just really not being my style and then also it being very much more an American novel than a Southern African novel, which made it feel like unnecessary for this vlog. I read um, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind and I felt like there were some aspects of that that I really enjoyed. It's been such a long time now since I read it um, though and it hasn't hugely stuck with me. It was very much written for an outsider. It was very much written for someone from to read and like understand Malawi and it was written with a lot of like individualism and it was very much like written with an American audience in mind. Like it would literally say, we call it this, which is the American this. So it had that glossing for the outsider. Um, but also I felt like the whole narrative itself like you know, I can't blame the guy because it's his narrative you know that's what his life is like but I felt like a lot of the analysis part of it felt very much like very individualistic didn't really talk about the like circumstances of what happened to Malawi to end up in the position it was like it was talking about the corruption in the government but nothing about the history of how that happened or came about which again isn't necessarily what the book was trying to tell me but is what I would have been more interested in. There were aspects that I found really funny and really endearing, very charming. A lot to like about the book, but it's just not a book that I was going to like, if that makes sense. Then after that, I read House of Stone by Navuyo Rosa Tshuma. This one I absolutely loved. I really, really enjoyed this book. Um, it's so well written. This one's possibly the most beautifully lyrically written out of all of them. Also really, really hard to read. Like there's a lot of trauma involved in this book because it is about Zimbabwe and the fight for independence and the genocide that happened during that. Um, there's obviously a lot of really difficult things to read, but I think that it does such a good job of, I feel like a lot of people wouldn't like this if they are the sort of people who dislike books where people who you were rooting for then do terrible things, um, which I know a lot of people get upset about, but I don't. And I particularly enjoyed this one for the beauty of the writing, for the way that it dealt with the history. Again, didn't feel like this one was pandering to me as an outsider, um, which, but maybe maybe someone who is from Zimbabwe would think it did because obviously I'm an out, I am an outsider. So, and I, I did keep looking stuff up um, outside of this in order to get a better understanding, um, which I don't mind doing. Uh, if Tshuma had, had to explain all of those things to me on the page, it would have felt much more heavy handed. Um, so I think that this one was brilliant, uh, really thrilling, really gripping. Um, like there's like identity theft, there's like manipulation um, done in such a way. So I think if you like thrillers, I think you would really like this one. Um, if you want like literary thrillers, then I think you would really like this um, because it has that kind of overtone to it. So I really, really enjoyed that one. Then I listened to Return to the Enchanted Island by Jahari Ravalasan, which was like a book of two halves for me, um, <laughs> interspersed throughout the whole of the book though. It's not like it was, I liked the first half and then the second half. It was, there were the bits that were retelling the foundation myth of Madagascar and the Malagasy people, which I thought was really, really interesting. And again, not pandering to me as an outsider because I had to go out and do a lot of research on my own um, but then the rest of it was very much like a millennial fiction thing which is not something I necessarily I don't think that that should be an insult um, but it was just so privileged that I found it very hard to get on board with um, the writing itself was very very beautiful some aspects of it that I was just a bit eye really about I was like come on <laughs> really um, but yeah I, I don't think it was a bad book it was definitely an enjoyable experience I liked the reading of it but it's not going to be one that's my favorite book or that I feel like reading again because he felt really privileged the main character and also the distance I felt from the book I didn't feel like a warmth to it um, it was very like clinical in those sections um, so whilst I feel like the myth part of it brought the book back up um, it wasn't my favourite. Then I read The Old Drift by Namwali Sopel and this one I really really enjoyed as well I thought this was a really brilliant book if you liked Homegoing I guess I haven't read it but I feel like if you like that you would like this um, anything with a lot of it's starts in 1904 and goes all the way to 2024 I think but it was published in 2018 just a bit like bit in the future from now um and it has so much in it like historical fiction family saga um science fiction kind of all combined together but the science fiction isn't like super heavy science fiction it's quite light science fiction along the lines of White Teeth by Zadie Smith I think I mentioned when I was talking about this that this book really really strongly reminds me of White Teeth by Zadie Smith but is of course not 
copying it in any way it just feel like it deals with a lot of similar themes um the characters in this i absolutely love they're so ridiculous it's a really funny book there's a lot of comedy and humor and like the human condition and like jane austen style satire i guess of the human condition um much like zadie smith does uh everyone in here is ridiculous like bernardine Evaristo as well they're all like very flawed people and you can see their flaws and still find them endearing so yeah i thought that this one was probably the most fun out of all the books i read and still deals with difficult topics of colonialism and race and um, identity and um, medical like abuse of black people and that sort of thing it deals with a lot of really dark topics but also has so much light and humor i think this is the one that if i read it again i would get the most out of a second reading of it this is the one out of all of them that i would probably recommend to everyone i feel like this one has the broadest appeal while still being a really good book um so yeah this one definitely if you haven't read i would recommend uh, so then I read Cry the Beloved Country by Alan Patton and like I was saying I think that this one is quite a safari novel. Alan Patton um, was writing from France I believe at the time and was clearly very clearly writing for a western audience. So while this has a lot of beautiful writing in it, really beautiful, it felt very like forgiving people was the main theme of it it wasn't really dealing with structural stuff it had a lot of the different arguments that people were making at the time in south africa i assume from what i can tell from reading the book and the introduction a lot of different perspectives and doesn't fall and falls down on a like non-racist side of that but again as i said when i was reading it it feels like it would have been progressive for 1948 and a little regressive now particularly in relation to the way it talked about blind people and stuff like that thought that that was not great um and yeah also i just felt like it was very much like sunshines and rainbows we should all hug and love each other and didn't go as deep as i would prefer um and definitely 100 percent felt like this was he didn't expect any black people to read this that's what it felt like so then I read The First Wife by um, Paulina Cicciane and this one, like I said, really, really interesting. Don't think it was written for an outside perspective at all, although there was a lot of discussions about we do this as part of our culture, we do this as part of our culture. So potentially it was written for an outsider, but um, kind of had some humour in it, was kind of really ridiculous at times, like it's a satire, so it meant, it's meant to be ridiculous. Um, I, I'm not saying that as a critique of the plot, like, oh, that would never happen. Like it was like out there melodrama very very big but the writing really let this one down and although of course i don't read portuguese so it might be due to tra translation i just felt like it was a little clunky and the second half was kind of unnecessary so i appreciate having read this but as a book itself i wouldn't necessarily recommend it and then i just told you about nervous conditions by tsitsi dangaramga so you know how i feel about that one these three here are my favourite, um, House of Stone, The Old Drift and um, Nervous Conditions. I really, really loved all of these books. If you love a slow literary coming of age novel, if you love plot but done in a really brilliant way with lots of character studies, um, if you like a dark book, a bit of a thriller those ones I would recommend to you for that reason. So that was the first of my reading around the world challenge. I really enjoyed it. Um, because I read House of Stone and The Old Drift so early on, I was wondering if, I think I wondered on the blog, if um, it's only the best books that make it from those countries to be published in the UK. And I think there is an aspect of that, that you have to be pretty good. It's not even the commercial stuff, it's hard to explain what I mean, but you know there's a lot of books published a year that aren't necessarily the best quality um, in terms of the writing or whatever, and that stuff wouldn't make it to be published globally so I think there is an aspect of that to it um I also always enjoy reading books from different cultures which is part of the reason that I'm doing this challenge and so I think that that also is a part of the reason why I really did enjoy a lot of these books um the the idea of a safari book is something that I'm definitely going to be keeping in mind as I go forward with this um reading around the world challenge how much of this book is being written for me as an outsider how much of my reading of this is voyeuristic rather than appreciative I don't know how to explain what I mean because I don't want it to be acquisitive in any way I want it to be because these books are as good as any of the books that I could read that were written in Britain or America and were really highly publicized I mean The Old Drift was pretty highly publicized and Tsitsi Dangaremga um, because she was shortlisted for the Booker last year all three of the books in that trilogy have been re-released and kind of pushed a bit more which is good which is great um, so and obviously Patton Cry the Beloved Country is a classic so it's one that I'd heard of even before this but yeah I think I need to keep in mind what my aim is with this because it could very easily become 
um oh we did africa like you know what i mean <laughs> if that's <laughs> people who say uh when they went traveling oh we did vietnam we did laos it's like what do you mean you did them um, and so I don't want my reading to become that sort of travel experience. I really had a great time though reading these novels and, I've, and I'm definitely going to try and read more of all three of these writers because they have been some of my favourite books I've read so far this year. This is probably a really long vlog so thank you if you've stuck around this long. Let me know in the comments what you thought. Have you read any of these books? Have you read any fiction from Southern Africa that you think I would really like? Um, please tell me in the comments down below and thank you for watching. Please remember to give this video a thumbs up if you liked it and to subscribe. I put out new videos three times a week and I will see you again very very soon. Bye bye!